Hello, I'm Tom Long. Welcome to Island Meditations, where we meditate on God's Word while enjoying views of the beauty of God's creation. Thank you for joining me. This week we're concluding a series where I've talked about the most important verse for the seeker, the most important verse for the new convert, and the most important verse for a believer. And we saw that the most important verse for the seeker was John 3.16, which said that uh, God loves us, whoever we are, wherever we are. The most important verse for the new convert was Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40, which tells us the most important commands for someone who wants to follow Christ. And those two commands were, love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor like you love yourself. <laughs> and finally, for the Christ follower, the most important verse was Mark chapter 10, verse 45, where we saw that Jesus calls us not only to love others, but to serve others. And so to be a Christ follower is to be a servant of all, to work for justice, to engage in acts of mercy, meeting the needs of those who we come into contact with and to those in far-flung reaches of the world, and finally, to walk humbly and faithfully with our God. So what's left? Well, the most important passage for the mission of the church is what is left. So this morning, as we are in uh, Sailfish Street Park, one of those cute little pocket parks in the uh, barrier islands along the coast of the Carolinas, um, we're going to talk about the most important verses for the mission of the church. Let's walk and talk. Does your church have a mission statement? What passage or passages is it based on? If I were on a committee to develop a mission statement for a church, the first place I would look would be the final words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Back in the 17th century, Baron Justinian von Welts, a Lutheran nobleman, was the first person known to have coined the phrase, the Great Commission. But it wasn't until the late 1800s that the term became widespread. It was then that it was popularized by the truly remarkable and innovative missionary to China, Hudson Taylor. The Great Commission refers to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I chose this passage for three reasons. First, it reminds us of who is in charge. Jesus begins by telling us that all authority to rule, to govern, has been given to him, both in heaven and on earth and the rest of the Great Commission builds on his position of authority. To be a church that follows Christ, we accept that Jesus is our Lord, our Master, our King. There are, are authorities below that level, but there are no authorities above that level. He is Lord. Secondly, we see that the church cannot just grow where she is. The church must also go to all the nations. The word that the NIV translates as nations, is ethnos, from which we get our English word ethnicity. The literal meaning of the word is people who share similar customs, language, and culture. But the Jews in Jesus' day used it to refer to ethnic groups whose people did not yet know God. Multicultural ministry is not an option for the church. It is a command. <laughs> and it makes sense, right? God sent Jesus because God loves the whole world. That's John 3.16. Jesus commanded us to love our neighbor, even our enemies. That's Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Jesus told us to serve the needs of others by promoting justice, showing mercy, and being trustworthy and faithful. 
Mark chapter 10, verse 45. So when Jesus gives the church her marching orders, we are told to spread his love to everyone. In his old age, the apostle John had a vision of heaven where he saw, quote, a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, unquote. Today, we live in an age where evangelism and missions are often cast in a very negative light. They are associated with coercion, pressure, deception, and disrespect. We Christians have historically gone about things in a wrong-headed way that has brought shame on the name of our Lord and undermined the beauty of our mission. I don't have time to go into all the biblical corrections to those errors, but I'll mention briefly that Peter told us to share the gospel with, quote, gentleness and respect, unquote. Paul told us not to engage in foolish arguments, but to gently instruct in, quote, the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, unquote. How someone responds is between themselves and God. We are told to be gentle, respectful, and humble. And regardless of how long it takes for someone to receive the good news, even if they never do, Jesus loves them and continues to love them. When the rich young ruler found the cost of following Jesus to be too high, he walked away and Jesus and his disciples did nothing to stop him from walking away. We're told that Jesus looked at this man and loved him. Never assume that the way the church has done things historically or the way things have always been done is what the Bible is commanding us to do. Human execution and divine command will never be totally aligned with one another until we all get to heaven. But that is not a reason not to try. It is a reason to learn from our mistakes and to grow. And for the church to grow, she must go beyond the borders of local ethnic groups to reach people who are not like us. Another way in which the church has sometimes fallen short is an understanding that the mission is not to tick off how many people prayed to receive Christ or how many people were baptized. The mission is to make disciples. <laughs> the Greek word for disciple appears only in the four gospels in the book of Acts. Disciple is a term that applies to anyone who allies themselves with Jesus, especially those who followed him around, learned what he was teaching, and participated in his mission of building the kingdom of God on earth. Discipleship begins with following the Lord in baptism. In my Baptist tradition, we describe baptism as an outward sign of an inward change. It is a public statement of our alliance with Jesus and with others who also follow Jesus. It symbolizes our identification with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Remember that Jesus described giving his life as a ransom for many, as itself being an act of service to others. Not only does baptism depict our cleansing from sin and deliverance from death by Jesus' sacrifice, it depicts our identification with Jesus and the church in serving others. We baptize in the name of the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the name of refers to the authority to baptize as having been delegated by the one who has all authority, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Church traditions vary in their understanding of baptism. The common thread is that it is a way to identify with Jesus' sacrificial service to ourselves and to the world and to identify with God's covenant community. But discipleship moves past following Jesus in baptism. The Great Commission includes teaching people of every tribe, nation, ethnic group, and language to, as Jesus said, quote, obey everything I have commanded you, unquote. Christianity isn't going to church on Sunday and then back to life as it was before we became disciples. It is also growing in how we yield ourselves to the Lordship of Christ. Jesus, as we reflected at the outset, has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. We are to obey everything he taught the disciples to do. Discipleship is joining with God in Christ out of God's great love, 
to give of ourselves in service to God and to all people everywhere. It is a mission too great for any one person to achieve on their own. It is a mission too great for the church universal to achieve by human power alone. But Jesus assures, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We're not in this alone. We are part of a team. And most importantly, Jesus is with us to the very end. No one church can reach the world. No one church can make disciples of every tribe, nation, ethnic group, and language. But every single church is called, even commanded, to be a part of, to participate in, the worldwide outreach described in the Great Commission. Does your church have this big of a vision with respect to the Great Commission? The church I'm attending says their mission statement is, quote, to be a lighthouse for all, to make disciples of Jesus Christ, to love, prepare, and serve from the sand and the sea, unquote. God grant each of our churches a vision of outreach, not only to people like ourselves, but to all people loving them and serving them whether or not they choose to join us in following you.